um, I'm really pleased to have you all here for our um, final masterclass of the fall season. And um, I'll just summarize the title and such um, since I think we do have a new face or two. So, um, so our fall season has been um, South Asia, the view from Columbia, um, featuring our South Asia faculty in these um, master classes that are intended um, for faculty to give a kind of, um, you know, maybe discussion of their most recent work, but also a sense of their intellectual um, trajectory, um, partly with the idea of, of allowing us to at some level model for graduate students what it's like to become an academic and to frame um, a, a scholarly career uh, around a certain um, you know, sort of personal intellectual agenda. Um, so I should mention actually, um, Mana, I forgot to mention this to you. Most of these events are recorded and publicly available through the South Asia Institute website. We actually have a rather um, antiquated website and it takes you to a um, YouTube link, but um, nevertheless, it's available. Um, and, and part of the idea was also to form, given that we have the technology to do this so easily, to form an archive of where we're at now uh, in South Asia. Unfortunately, we weren't, we didn't do something analogous say 10 years ago or five years ago when um, there were a number of other uh, really important people here that, that are um, now um, retired or have unfortunately died. Um, and we will continue uh, somewhat more sporadically in the spring. Um, we currently have um, Gayatri Spivak and Akhil Bilgrami on the list for spring. Um, and as well as a, a new book event with Manan Ahmed uh, and more to come that will be announced. So today, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce Mana Kia, who came to Columbia in 2013 and is now associate professor in the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies. Um, she has a PhD from Harvard in history uh, in history and Middle Eastern studies. Uh, she did a postdoc at um, the Center for the History of Emotions at the Max Planck Institute uh, for Human Development in Berlin. Uh, like most other South Asia faculty we've heard from, uh, this is actually kind of remarkable this year, she has a new book, um, Persian Itself, Memories of Place and Origin Before Nationalism, which was published in May by Stanford University Press. Um, I think I won't say anything about it because we will be getting to it later um, in uh, the, the class today. So um, I'll just mention that you've also, Mana has also published a number of articles and book chapters, including several articles on gendered selves, both men and women, and has a number of exciting new projects in the works as well, which I hope we'll hear something about. Um, so my idea right now, instead of giving you any of the substance of it, um, uh, I'll let Mana um, put together into a narrative of an intellectual journey, um, something that goes beyond the measured, perhaps empty spaces of a CV to use an image um, that comes out of her book, um, or however you wanna structure your time with us. Um, so um, thank you so much and welcome. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming um, and Kathy for the invitation. Um, so what I thought I would do is um, I, I made kind of two blocks of presentations. Um, and the first um, will be my kind of, I, I framed it as intellectual trajectory slash research. Um, and, then the, and then I thought I would stop and we could have a conversation and then um, I'll actually talk about the, the um, finished uh, research <laughs> um, in the second book, the book and a couple of things that I'm working on after that. Um, and, and then we can talk about that. And I know that some of you read um, the sort of intro and last chapter and stuff of the book. So you have some sense of that. And so I'm happy in the second half to take more, more questions that are specifically 
um, about the book or the reading or anything like that. Um, so I'm going to start by first sharing um, a paragraph that I wrote as part of um, what you have to do when you're on tenure track, which is um, get, uh, submit review materials. And the, and, um, the, the kind of farther along you go um, on this track, um, the more people read this statement. And often it has to be legible to people that are not in your field. Um, so um, one of the things I always tell graduate students who make it um, to the, the very end and they're going on the job market, it's like, you have to be able to tweet your dissertation topic. It has to be some kind of short bite-sized explanation. Then you have to be able to give a paragraph version like you would maybe you know, um, uh, at a conference uh, in, in speech. And then you, know, then you get it to the longer explanations. Um, but, but those short bits are really important. And so I'm gonna give you that. And then I'm gonna go through and talk about kind of how I got um, to the end product. <laughs> um, so, I am a scholar of the connected histories of late medieval and early modern Central, South and West Asia in the High Persianate period, which I define roughly as the 14th to 19th centuries. I focus in particular on the circulation of people, texts, practices and ideas between South and West Asia from the 17th to 19th centuries. Um, my work is transregional, straddling Middle Eastern and South Asian studies. It's also interdisciplinary drawing on sources and approaches of history, literature, and historical anthropology. I make use of the methodological and analytic tools of inter-Asian, Indian Ocean, post-colonial, and gender and sexuality studies. Overall, my work engages with the ways in which intellectual and cultural milieus signify and the social relations possible within them. Temporally, I think critically about the continuities and ruptures of modernity as they are, as I think that there are considerable insights to be gained from the study of times before modernity on its own terms. I'm concerned with exerting critical pressure on the assumptions that sustain and underlie contemporary conceptual categories most often used for the study of earlier periods. Doing so allows for seeing anew those categories um, and meanings we take as givens, such as affiliations between people and groups across the lines of difference that we have assumed are definitive. Challenging the naturalness and in inevitability of present configurations in ways that are vital for finding our way forward in the world today. Um, and just as a little bit of background, um, the term Persianate has been used in a variety of ways to describe the distinct political and cultural formations and their intellectual and literary corpus characterizing Eastern Islamic domains. Um, when I began my work, Persian studies was located in and bifurcated by regional studies divisions. The domain of Persian was part of the Iranian national subset of Middle East studies and Persian and South Asian studies was called Indo-Persian and treated separately both from Persian in the Middle East and also from things Indic, uh, though it's influenced by it, thus the hyphen. Um, although trans-regional studies are gaining prominence in their own right, these national and regional divisions are still institutionally entrenched and reflected in bodies of scholarship that seldom overlap. Um, new critical attention is solely enriching this conversation, but methodological nationalism casts a long shadow on historical studies that my work seeks to dispel. Um, so the Persianate um, is, a, is an opportunity to think um, with an intermediate scale of analysis somewhere between the regional and the global. Um, and I gained a lot of inspiration from other intermediate scales that overlapped with the Persianate, such as Indian Ocean studies or the more land-based uh, inter-Asian studies, which is a kind of newer term for thinking about linkages um, within Asia, roughly. Um, all right, so my scholarly life uh, began as an MA student at NYU's Kevorkian Center, um, studying modern Iran. Um, I ended up writing my thesis, which became my first published article about the history of women's rights activism in post-World War II Iran, leading up to the 1979 anti-Shah revolution. At the time, accounts of women's rights agreed on very little 
except that they were royal grants bestowed from above by a Shah who, had, who either benevolently gave enlightened gifts, such as the right to vote or broaden access to divorce and child custody from dastardly mullahs. This is the narrative. Um, or else as part of modernization from above by an authoritarian ruler who had swallowed up all space for civil society. Um, in contrast, I asked how and why a clearly misogynist ruler, um, very clear from his interviews, um, gave women's right, women rights he barely believed them to need or be worthy of. Um, uh, and how we can consider the activism of women in an authoritarian environment working within the state. Um, for this work, I drew on published materials by various women's organizations, um, as well as oral history transcripts from Harvard's uh, Iranian Oral History Archive. Um, but overall, when I left my MA studies, I had a sense of dissatisfaction with the focus of scholarship on modern Iran, which always seemed to be about Europe and what Iranians ambivalently learned or resisted learning. Um, so then I took some years out of school and decided to get a job. Um, and one of the things that I did is that I read pretty widely. Um, and I read amongst other things, Amitav Ghosh's novels, which included um, The Glass Palace, which is set in late 19th and early 20th century Bay of Bengal, which is also where uh, most of my maternal family lived. Um, and in that book and in his In an Antique Land, which outlined a medieval Indian Ocean world of linkages between Middle East and South Asia, I was really electrified by the tantalizing narratives with Africans and Asians at the center. Um, these connections told a very different story of ties, affinities, and mobilities than the more common depiction of globalization as a modern phenomena brought to Asia by Europeans. Um, but Gosha's vision of the Indian Ocean was extremely romantic, and he claimed that what he was looking at was dead and lost. I wondered, was it medieval and was it entirely lost? But regardless, I knew I had something to learn. Um, so I began reading about earlier times before colonialism and nationalism of Indian Ocean and intra-Asian circulations and of the wider Persian speaking world beyond Iran. And this led me to the um, foundational scholarship of, of people such as Mozaffar Alam, Sanjay Subramaniam, uh, and Muhammad Tavakoli. And I realized that my family's history of generations, literally hundreds of years, spent in Hindustan and Burma were part of something far older and more vast. And when I began reading Persian texts actually from the 18th and early 19th century, and these were first travel texts and then other kinds of commemorative texts, I also saw some disjuncture with the scholarship that existed at the time. Um, now this was a while ago, um, you know, something like 15 years ago, and there's been a lot of really amazing work since then. But much of what I can read- I just, Sorry, can I just interrupt for just a second, just to maybe in the interest of making it a little interactive um, too, is that I'm thinking of um, back when I was due, at Duke, pretty kind of around the time that you were coming to these realizations, we were starting to have seminars on, um, you know, focusing on oceans rather than land masses. And, and you know, this is something that was starting to be in the air. Um, so it's really interesting to hear your, your coming to it through a novel. <laughs> you know, I think it's great. I mean, that's, that's how I came to it. And then when I went to graduate school, I mean, I was also one of Aung San Ho's students um, just before oh. he went to Duke. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I was talking about a time actually before Aung San Ho came to Duke. Uh -huh. But then, of course, it, it was much um, elaborated uh, once he got there. Uh, actually, Car uh, Karen Wigan. Um, uh -huh. was, um, had a had a you know sort of a funded project on uh, Oceans Connect, I think it was called. Right, right. Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah, that ended up being a volume, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. I was part of those early early conversations. Uh, I didn't contribute to a volume. To, you know those university seminars where you go and you listen weekly. Yeah, uh, which some of us are here are doing. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um. So. So basically a lot of the scholarship that I was reading, my, my issue with it is that 
A lot of it evaluated the period before the rise of colonial modernity with categories, terms, and understandings belonging to this later period. Um, and this seemed limiting to me because categories are important. And if you begin with too many assumptions, you generally find what you're looking for. Um, at the risk of obscuring everything else that does not fit and might change its meaning. Um, so the work I started doing was in part dedicated to clearing conceptual ground to be able to even speak about what I was interested in. Um, and I mean, this kind of goes with what Sheldon Pollock has pointed out, which is how can we know what colonialism and its forms of knowing changed if we don't know what was there before? Um, so in general, the main question animating my work is what kinds of histories, meaning worlds, ties, and divisions do we see when we look beyond nationalist and regional frames to the thick and deep paths connecting various parts of Asia together? Um, and I focus on South Asia, but I actually think that um, my approach to it is that we need to look at it um, in conversation with older connected paths. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I'm most interested in. Um, but I realize that speaking of connections runs the risk of romanticizing a cosmopolitan pre-modern. Um, but I was writing in the context of scholarship that assumed divisions and knowing what was shared seemed essential to a, pre a truly historicized understanding of what was not. Um, so the dissertation research I did sought to look at Persians circulating in the Indian Ocean from the 18th to the 20th century. So a lot more uh, contemporary than what I ended up writing about. Um, starting from the point when Persian was still a lingua franca and the language of rule in Hindustan, but after Timurid rule was largely defunct. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but during, the, during my um, dissertation work, I did uh, archival research in various locations in Myanmar India, Iran, and Britain, looking into both public and private archives, reading texts and documents, interviewing whomever I could, um, scanning their photographs, uh, photographing local tombstones, buildings, pr processions, um, hearing stories and memories. Um, and part of this research entailed visiting manuscript archives, such as the rich collection um, at the Khodabakhsh Library in Patna. Um, and at the tail end of this research in Tehran, I visited the International Book Fair they have there every year um, and saw an array of newly published Indo-Persian texts that were increasingly demanding my attention. So from travelogues to biographical compendia, memoirs and collections of poetry, I saw what had been cited sparingly in previous scholarship, but was now published with a critical apparatus, which would enable me to read thousands of pages of such texts together. Um, uh, and I'll show you the problem of reading these texts that are often very long and like really crunched little Shikasta writing. <laughs> um, and, and how uh, when you have these in print editions, you can read 20 of them, right? In a way that you can't um, when they're in manuscripts. Um, so within those pages though, I found the inexplicable. Additionally, I still had no way to make sense of the more recent sources I had collected. Why, for instance, was the Shia mosque of my putatively Iranian ancestors in Rangoon called the Mughal Shia Masjid um, and referred by everyone else as the Bade Masjid? Why did my grandmother, who immigrated to Iran in her 20s from Rangoon, speak Urdu? Why was their surname before immigration Kaboli? <laughs> in these travelogues, I did not meet Iranians. Uh, why were people from Iranian lands called Qazalbash in Hindustan? Um, I had to work out the ground of the pre-modern before colonial power and knowledge began to exert dominance. There was no way to make sense of the earlier period otherwise. And I'm gonna show you some pictures from some of the research that I did, um, which maybe will be uh, helpful. Here. Hang on. All right. Um, these are some of the people I interviewed in Rangoon. This is um, the 2007, 2008 period of time that I was doing um, research. Uh, this is here. 
um, this is the plaque for the uh, Mughal Shia Masjid uh, that I visited, um, which apparently dates back to 1854 and has been rebuilt a number of times. Um, this one in 1918 in what is the Hyderabadi architectural style. Um, this is me geeking out. Um, this is the storeroom um, in the kind of uh, basement, the records room of the masjid. Um, these are some of the documents, for instance, that I photographed. This is a marriage register. Um, you can see this is clear. This is these, um, the earliest ones they had really were um, like, I think they started in about 1917, 1918. Um, just to give you a close up. And I'm highlighting the highlights also showed that I was tracing particular people through different kinds of records. Um, this is me with the Nigahban, the, the kind of caretaker of the masjid who, I mean, and all these people are my relatives. Um, it was very, very helpful to be able to go there and say, look, the first two trustees are my great, great grandfathers <laughs> respectively. <laughs> and so I could like, you know, I had a, a kind of instant access, which was very, very helpful. Um, but this is uh, Muhammad Reza Shirazi, um, also Mong Mong Ta. Um, and this is the um, Naz ceremony. Um, this is the grandmother and her granddaughter and the mother was sick and they were having a kind of prayer and um, uh, sort of uh, sofre, uh, offering food to everybody and sort of hoping she'll get better. Uh, this is the burial ground. And these are some of the tombstones. Uh, these are the tombstones of the families that are, um, these are pictures of the families that are mentioned on the tombstones. These are some Kabbalis. These are some Shushtaris. And these are some later tombstones. You can see they put the anglicized date. Um, and this is 1930, I think two. Um, these are also Shushtaris and these are later day ones. And you can see the languages start to change on the tombstones. Um, and you also have, you know, the, the dual names start to come in too. Um, and this is in Patna and this is my uh, travel partner, <laughs> Sara Wahid, who teaches at Davidson College now. Um, this is the family we stayed with because when you travel to certain places, it, you know, showing up as a woman by yourself can be challenging. Um, so you use lots of local connections. Um, these are some of the manuscripts I collected, um, which I was very grateful not to have to read all 2000 pages in Chicasta. Um, and I'll stop here. And this is the the kind of uh, this is what I end up ended up with. But so that was the dissertation project, um, which brought me to basic questions about what about what it meant that Iran and, and Hindustan shared the same language of government, high culture, and learning for hundreds of years. And to think about this question with a focus on the period just after the fall of the Safavids in 1722. Um, but kind of before the British, up to the British abolition of Persian in an official capacity in the 1830s, um, I wrote a dissertation which was called Contours of Persianate Community. And about half of it deeply revised and, and expanded on eventually became this book, Persianate Selves. The other half of the dissertation has been reworked and added to um, part of a second book about how Adab and its circulation of texts, people, practices, and ideas made the Persianate world. And I'll talk about that more later. But I want to stop here um, and uh, sort of talk about any questions or thoughts or um, ideas you had. And this was mainly to give you a sense of, um, you know, the, the often crooked and difficult um, ways in which you end up, you know, with the book. <laughs> 
So please um, ask, jump in. Uh, I know it's always hard in this, in this um, format, but um, we'd love to hear your thoughts and reactions. Um, can I ask uh, Professor Kia? Um, I also read um, Amitav Ghosh at Harvard and he really got me interested in um, Geniza documents. Is that something that you've looked into like a Judeo-Persian documents in the pre-modern? Um, I have not used Geniza documents. Geniza documents are like specifically the, the ones in Egypt, right? Um, so I don't use those, um, although I use them in translated versions and to teach. Um, but the I, I have used some Judeo-Persian sources. Um, they, we don't have like a, apparently there's a rumor that there's um, Judeo-Persian documents, kind of like the Geniza. Apparently yeah. they're from, from yeah. some cave in Central Asia, yeah. <laughs> um, but they haven't like hit the they haven't hit the scholarly scene yet. They're still basically circulating in the market. Um, but we do have some chronicles um, and local histories and um, as well as Masnavi, um, narrative poems and stuff in Judeo-Persian. Um, and I've looked at, I'm looking, I'm actually incorporating a little bit more of those in my second project um, because I'm using it as a counter case study um, for thinking about Persian as it's used by non-Muslims, um, partly to put some pressure on this idea that um, th there's a kind of um, narrative in South Asian studies about um, the uniqueness, the exceptionalism of, of South Asia. And um, th there's a basis of this argument, which is basically like, oh, Muslim rulers arrived there and they had to be practical and they had to become more tolerant um, because they were ruling over majority non-Muslim populations. But the fact is that um, up until 1500, many, many places under Muslim rule were majority not Muslim. Um, and one example obviously is Egypt, which was not majority Muslim until about 1500. Um, so at the time the Geniza documents <laughs> are being written, um, they are a, a way in which Arabic is being used by a non-Muslim population in a majority non-Muslim country um, under Muslim rule. So I wanted to kind of, I, I've been looking at Persian written by Hindus, um, but I wanna kind of use the Judeo-Persian example because most of those are from Iran or Central Asia to think about how Persian gets used in the, the role of religion and affiliation and things like this um, to, to, put a, to, to make it not so special about India, to, to link, to show that in fact there, there is a, when Persian arrives and starts to be um, proliferate in South Asia, it's, it's part of a living tradition of um, non-Muslims participating in that culture. And um, I'm doing something a little bit similar in my dissertation where I'm um, talking about the use of Judeo-Arabic in Baghdadi Sufism in the mm -hmm. 12th and 13th centuries. I'm interested, do you have any theoretical works that you could recommend for thinking about language in like in use of by minorities? Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's theoretical work done. There's, there's a fair amount of scholarship that's been looking at this. Um, and if you want to email me, it might be easier for me to okay. send you that kind of stuff. But there's, there's good stuff. Um, from Middle East studies as well as South Asian studies has thought about this more um, as well. Um, but the point, the point I think is important is that discussions about this in the context of South Asian studies are often very much cut off from similar discussions in the context of Middle East studies. Um, and that seems like a shame. <laughs> Yeah, and of course we have the issues of of training in languages. Um, you know, if you're, it, 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 it's hard to really become a master at being able to read multiple um, language sources in multiple languages. And uh, you know, this I don't know how we transcend that challenge. But um, I mean, that's a challenge. But even when we're talking about the same language. Um, 
there was a book a few years ago that came out where um, the main sources were um, basically um, epistolary culture. Um, and they contain no citations from uh, work on Iran that had used the same sources um, mm -hmm. in the same period. And I found that to be a, a real kind of symptom of this bizarre bifurcation, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, my Arabic is rudimentary, um, but I can still read scholarship <laughs> on, um, you know, stuff on Egypt <laughs> and stuff on the Geniza documents, mm -hmm. um, even if I can't read the primary sources myself. Yeah, yeah, and that's, and, and of course, as scholarship moves along, we have more and more people who have consulted these sources, presumably, there is a deeper and deeper um, body of scholarship where you can borrow the expertise of other people um, in a way that I think maybe wasn't possible, you know, a, a generation ago. But we do have these di disciplinary divides that make it, you know, sort of keep the blinders on. I mean, I, I find it to be a, a this kind of boundary of regional studies where, you yeah. know, when you exit the region, it's like stage left, <laughs> you know, um, and, yeah. Yeah. And, and not all topics, that's not appropriate to all topics, right? Like that, that ends up um, producing a particular view um, that requires amputation. Um, especially certain things like when you're thinking about um, Islam in, in various ways, you're, you're thinking about traditions or um, networks of people or, um, you know, bodies of texts where, you know, if you think just about Indo-Persian, um, you have a series of um, ideas and um, texts that were, were very local to particular parts of South Asia, but we're drawing on, um, you know, an earlier corpus and tradition that was not. Um, and that also needs to be taken seriously to some degree. Yeah, I, mean, I think one of the sources of distortion um, was, say, for example, in, in South Asia, what the British did to the educational system. I know in, um, you know, in, in Punjab, where, it's, where I know more about it than other places, um, I mean, they really systematically uh, dismantled uh, local education to replace it with uh, English influenced education, you know, and, and really uh, denigrated um, the, the kind of learning that was happening. Uh, and so you had this idea of um, local populations being uneducated until they had access to these um, schools and they systematically tried to retrain. They didn't, couldn't replace all the teachers, so they re retrained them. But um, what was lost was any recognition of these kinds of um, uh, networks of scholarship that really were not um, locally delimited or even regionally delimited. I think, I mean, absolutely. And um, there's a brand new article that just came out um, on Sindh in the 18th century. And it's, it's actually called regionalization without vernacularization. Mm -hmm. And the British um, were operating with all these ideas of, of what languages were proper to Hindustan. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, Macaulay doesn't mention Persian once, right? The languages of India are Sanskrit and Arabic. Um, and then there's a bunch of vernaculars um, and, and Persian doesn't fit in that sort of model um, of the scriptural and the local, right? The mm. authentic. But I actually think that there has been um, a real endurance of these particular ideas of nativeness um, and what is proper and indigenous that you can see in scholarship too. And I mean, not to single her out, but I remember having this amazing conversation with Farida Mir, um, who wrote the book on Punjabi. Um, and she um, was looking at the Hiranja story, um, mm. really kind of starting with Vadesha, um, who, who produces that um, as a Masnavi, right? He, she, he produces a Khamsa in Punjabi.
And Hiranja is one of those stories, but included in the Hamsa is also a version of Lady Majnun. Hmm. And she doesn't look at that because she says that's not local to Punjab, right? And so the, these kinds of decisions that get made, Varad Shah wrote a Hamsa. Um, and he decided to write in Punjabi a version of Leili Majnun as part of that. Now, obviously, that's a nod to a, an older tradition. And by that point in South Asia, people were producing hamsas, which are groups of five narrative poems, um, you know, on the model of Nizami, Amir Khosro, Jami, and numerous others. Uh, but replace like taking out you know and and even those older kind of more classical writers had hadn't all reproduced the same five poems um and so Vada Shah was part of this tradition writing in Punjabi and and bringing in uh, you know a more local story but that doesn't make Leili Majnun any less part of Punjab <laughs> right? except a certain kind of idea of what's proper to a locale and what's foreign, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Rachel. Thoughts? I have two questions. Thank you so much, Mana. It's very interesting to hear all about this. Um, two small questions that are very simple, I'm sure, for you, for you to answer. I always thought that um, Macaulay was specifically implying that English should take over from Persian as the language of government. I mean, wasn't it up until 1835? It, uh, so anyway, I'm confused about that. And secondly, well, yeah, go ahead. Th that's what's amazing, right? Is that Macaulay has his minute and it's before, um, it, it happens over a period of five years where Persian is taken out first from, I think, I can't remember the exact order, but it gets taken out from government and then the judiciary and then um, diplomatically. Um, and it's in, it's in a couple of stages. Um, and he writes the minute right when this is happening, but there is no mention of Persian in the minute. Fascinating. Because um, I was shocked. <laughs> it is shocking. Thank you for shocking me. Uh, <laughs> the second question is just about your family. It's so interesting. So uh, your family, uh, is partly from Rangoon? Both of my maternal grandparents um, were raised in Rangoon and they were third and fourth and generation of people who had arrived there. So um, they were, what was the, um, I, tell me about the, um, the context in which they went to Rangoon. I mean, like Ilana, I'm aware of the Baghdadi Jews who settled in Rangoon. Um, but just, I'm just very interested why they went there and and uh, what their context was. I mean, it's really part of a it's part of a broader history. And um, you know, the British took over Burma in three stages, mm -hmm. um, like starting in the early um, 19th century. But but that entire Bay of Bengal area had been in contact with Hindustan for a while. Um, so, so some of the families that I talked to, um, they had already been there before the British. Um, there was a family of Shirazis who were lamplighters in Mandalay um, and they were commissioned by the, the um, Burmese monarchy to kind of light all the lamps <laughs> in town <laughs> around the palace. Um, so there were, there were people that were already there along with um, certain kinds of Armenian merchants. Um, you know, so this is part of an older kind of um, merchant and um, a diaspora that had been there before the British. But when the British um, took over, um, particularly when they took over kind of low, uh, lower Burma, um, that, that happened in, I think, 1853. Um, Rangoon was like a fishing village and they took it and they created it as their base and they linked its administration um, to Bengal. And they opened immigration uh, to Burma to all of British India. So it really wasn't immigrating. You were just going to another part of India to go to Rangoon. And we think of Rangoon as kind of a backwater now, but it was actually one of the richest ports of British India. Mm 
Got it. Um, and and by the early by the by the 1920s and 30s, um, it, it was there were huge numbers of South Asians living in Lower Burma. Um, so it, it was a very um, it was it ended up becoming a very South Asian place. Thank you. Wonderful. Should I should I continue with the book? We can't hear you, Kathy. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I get I have some noise in the background, so I keep muting to be sure it doesn't bleed in. Um, yeah. So unless anybody else has another thought, observation, um, you know, so it can be even like a stray thought that's been triggered by. Um, uh, yeah, Arundhati. Um, Hi, Professor. I have a question. Oh. 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 Rishi, why don't you wait until then, Rishi? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was wondering. Um, Rishi, can you hang a, on? Arundhati is oh. asking her question first. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's all. That's all. And I think there's a little confusion. Um, I had a very, um, like, a very general thought about uh, while reading about your work. The kind of sources you looked into, because uh, also I, I read the same article you were talking about regionalization without vernacularization. So I was wondering if what about sources, the kind of sources you looked into while writing your work, and uh, the role of Tazkiras and uh, the Bayas basically, were they a part of uh, your research as well? Because, um, uh, I have uh, heard about the skiras in context with uh, Kashmiri history as well. So I just wanted to know something about that. Um, I'm happy to talk about that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more formally um, when I discuss the book. But Tasket is, I mean, they're, they're really a quintessentially um, early modern genre. Um, I used, one of the reasons I was really excited to see the printed text is because Tasket is can be quite long. Um, and I wanted to read many of them together. The other thing I wanted to do um, is to, I thought it was important to look at texts that only circulated regionally, sometimes in small areas, um, against the backdrop of texts that maybe circulated a bit more like in South Asia or in Iran, and then also against the background of texts that circulated transregionally. Right, and because I wanted to look at those different levels and think about what was what was most what was shared in terms of um, types of meaning and language, and um, because I wanted to look at the kind of common her hermeneutical ground. Um, in this book, I didn't talk as much about the. Um, I, I did a little bit talk about conflicts and disagreements, right? Because just because people share a language, they don't agree on everything. But it is fairly important that they shared the same ideas, right? Um, and so they had a common language with which to discuss, um, argue, um, disagree, right? Um, and a lot of times what gets done in the scholarship is that these disagreements are given kind of proto-nationalist weight. So these people thought this because they were Iranians and these people thought this because they were Hindustanis. And, and when I started to look at something else that's really important for the 18th century, which is a, a very um, heated set of uh, uh, literary debates around proper um, poetic usage, um, this became helpful um, to, to kind of understanding what the terms um, and the issues were past um, proto-nationalism, which I didn't really find to be very helpful. Um, and, and yeah, I don't, I don't look at, uh, I don't look at Bayaz as much as I look at Tasquedas. Um, I look a little bit more at literary treatises and, and poetry um, in the next book, not in this one, but the chapters that dealt with literary disputes I kind of had to put in the second book. <laughs> So those didn't make it into this one. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Uh-huh. Vishi, go ahead. 
Hi, sorry about that. Um, so my question, um, as this, like I've just been studying a lot of contemporary uh, Bangladeshi politics and Pakistani politics. Um, and you know, one of the issues leading to the second partition and the creation of Bangladesh was this belief among the Pakistani military that, and a lot of political elites that the way that Bangladeshis practiced Islam uh, was not, was fraudulent, right? Because they're incorporating syn syncretic Hindu traditions, Hindu ways of worship and all of these things. So I was just really, I was wondering how does this whole history of religious syncretism in Bengal play into how uh, the Favids and these different Persians were thinking of Adab? How are they kind of engaging with these different cultural and religious forms of worship while also kind of operating within this um, trans-regional idea of, you know, aesthetic and ethical conduct? Um, I mean, that's a pretty big question, um, but I think there's, there's two, uh, there's two tracks that usually um, one can go down. One is thinking about, and this has been done in some of the more recent scholarship, some of the translation projects um, that have gone on um, in the earlier period um, where uh, Muslims have basically been interested in trying to translate from various kinds of um, Sanskrit knowledge systems, right? Um, now, one of the things that I think is important to that, to looking at that, um, is the fact that Persian already had an apparatus um, for this, which was kind of most closely developed in the Mongol context where they were trying to take in everything from Chinese medical knowledge to uh, Mongol um, kind of um, mythological and historical traditions and trying to incorporate it into Persianate knowledge. Um, so that's one way. The other way is that um, some of the people that I interviewed and some of the practices that I heard about, um, you know, these people that eventually became marked as Irani and migrated back to Iran, some of them went to Pakistan also, um, uh, you know, that that were Mughals or like those pictures I showed you, um, you know, for Muharram, um, one of the things that they do, um, and I even saw a more recent video of it, as well as hearing about stories about how this was done in the early 20th century, uh, so it's not like a new thing, <laughs> is that they walk over fire, they walk over hot coals. Um, as part of Mahadam, which is not something that is done really anywhere else, definitely not in Iran. <laughs> right? um, and this practice came under fire starting in the early 20th century under various pressure of various reform movements. Um, but it was happening at the same time as um, a number of practices in Iran were also coming under pressure, right? So it really wasn't about the foreignness of them, whether they were syncretic or not. The problem was this is not proper because there's too much harm involved and it makes us look savage in front of the uh, Europeans, <laughs> right? Um, so along with reformers putting pressure on, on walking over hot coals during Mahadam, they were putting pressure on people using swords to beat themselves in the head and bleed. And that was a very common practice in Iran at the same time. So. The, these kind of transnational networks of reformers, um, now we call those practices syncretic in a way that really wasn't the focus of attack a um, hundred years ago. Um, I don't really know how to answer your question any other way because it's a very big one, but there, there, there are various different ways in which um, interaction and incorporation um, took place. And this practice of celebrating Mahadam um, by walking over hot coals was understood to be totally Paka Mughal Shia practice. It's okay. Like the, it was not a, um, an issue. Um, and they had their own mujtahids um, trained in Arag and all of that. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Shall we move okay. into, into the next phase? 
sure. Um, all right, back to this. Um, so I don't know how much, I'm gonna assume I don't really need to tell you about Persian um, and its kind of history um, because assume, I'm assuming you've read at least the introduction of the book. Um, but I think that the, the point that I, that I make um, about Persian besides its kind of status as a trans-regional language is that a, a set of, um, because of the form of circulation of people, text, practices, and ideas, um, and this is particularly in the form of stories as well as the more rarefied textual traditions, um, this corpus um, imparts a set of sensibilities. Um, and I locate this in the concept of adab. Um, but I also argue that Persianate sensibilities had to be acquired because one was never born with them. So Persians thus become a kind of person who had received a particular form of basic education that imparted the Persianate through which they understood and engaged with the world. So Persian was a textual corpus whose encapsulated meanings also lived and circulated orally in stories and in verse for broader audiences. So Persians become the possessors of the Persian language. They learned adab through its verses and stories, which means they learned how to behave at appropriate moments with gratitude or generosity, when it was called for and towards whom. So adab was the proper form of things of being in the world. Um, and this concept I basically gloss as proper aesthetic and ethical forms of thinking, acting, speaking, and thus of perceiving, desiring, and experiencing, and locate this as the kind of providing the coherent logic of being Persian. Um, and what was proper to one context was relational, which means that it was in, it could be inappropriate in another context. Um, and uh, to learn these forms, to identify their appropriate moments and to inhabit them successfully was to be an ideal Persian. Now, not everyone was ideal, uh, but through their longing for it, people could belong. And this is where things like hierarchy and proximity come in. Um, so the kind of point that I wanna make, and here, let me move to um, here. That's the cover of the book. And this is the picture um, that it's taken from, which is an illustration of Homayun, um, Babur's son, uh, and Tahmas, who's the second Safavid Shah. Um, and this is a picture of their kind of famous meeting um, when Homayun flees to Iran. Um, and, uh, and Tahmas receives him and kind of gives him military aid, which is how he ends up kind of reconquering um, uh, Hindustan. Um, and this is the event as it's commemorated in the Akbar Um And I thought this was an interesting thing because it's that's supposed to be Tahmas capital of Ghazvin in the back, um, but it's in um, an Indo-Persian text, right? And it's a, it's an event that I talk about in the book, which gets memorialized over and over and over again for hundreds of years as the basis of a certain kind of understood relationship between Iran and India um, and between specifically the two dynasties. Um, so, um, so this is the map from my book. Um, and this is the map you're maybe more used to seeing. Um, my book isn't the story of empires, but here's the political state of things in 1700, one which is more likely familiar to you. Um, and my book in particular um, is really about the 18th century. Um, I don't wanna give you uh, too much of a sense of, um, this is Safavid Iran, um, the historical context. And this is kind of what happens to Mughal India by 1770s, right? What you see is the rise of regional kingdoms. Um, and amongst these regional kingdoms, you have Hyderabad, I mean, that's Ud Avad, <laughs> um, and Bengal, which eventually gets taken over by the British. Um, so they become one of these regional successor states or attempt to. Um, and 
this is the map I use in my book, which is one without political borders, which I think was appropriate given the flux um, in politics, but also because I wanted to tell a story where political determinism was suspended um, to bring another kind of picture into focus. So the book presents an argument about what place and origin meant for Persians across Iran and Hindustan in the 18th century. And specifically, I outline how the expansive and multiple notions of place and origin allowed for a range of possibilities of collective affiliation out of which pre-modern Persianate selves grew. And I bring together works usually understood as separate genres, biographical compendiums, travelogues, histories, memoirs, and poetry under the heading of commemorative texts based on their shared imperative of commemoration, as well as common forms and features. Um, the same overarching logic of diversity, of difference legible as coherence, governed the range um, of possible conceptions of place and origin. And ultimately, I argue that multiple places and origins, um, a diversity understood as necessary and proper, um, constituted a range of Persianate collectives and their selves that crossed modern boundaries. So this means that pre-nationalist Persians were from many lands, religions, occupations, social locations, and even genders, though these boundaries possessed apparatic rather than categorical distinctions that require reassessment of their historical meanings. Um, and so the central premise of place is that the overarching logic of modern empirical geography was but one possible mode of knowing place because it was embedded in and continuous with other modes of knowing place that were different and even undermined empiricism, we can't view it as definitive. And the three chapters in this section address significance, um, the significance of different scales of place, the possible modes of place making, and the way places were invested with meaning. Um, that's the table of contents. The three chapters in section two examine the meaning and labor of origins among Persians between Safavid Iran and Timurid India. And I begin with the common modern assumption that a homeland in the Safavid kingdom established a primordial proto-Iranian loyalty that marked all migrants to Hindustan, even those in Timurid imperial service. Um, and modern scholarship possesses limited conceptual means by which to understand origins outside of mutually exclusive categories taken to be definitive of affiliation. Place is given prominence along with religion, nationality, and ethnicity. Um, and I argue that modern categories are either not definitive or else entirely inappropriate. And the one I kind of specifically take on is ethnicity. Um, and then the last, um, the last chapter kind of brings a lot of these ideas together and looks specifically at the changing political and economic factors in the 18th century that challenge social connectives and um, the co connections and collective affiliation, um, raising the stakes for commemoration for communities facing fracture and reconstitution. Um, and this chapter focuses on Tasketa writing in the aftermath of imperial devolution uh, focusing on the insight they offer into possibilities for articulating collectives and selves. Um, and specifically, I look at poetic Tasketas because these commemorate aesthetically and socially constituted collectives of Persians. Um, and these included past and contemporary poets as part of an imagined community of ancestors and peers. Um, and these and these lives and the collectives they commemorated were communities of adab that manifested moral order. And in times of upheaval or transition, when moral lives were more difficult and in ethical subjects, connections were more challenging to maintain, Tasket has preserved moral possibilities for better times. Um, and so unsurprisingly, as imperial structures began to unravel, these texts proliferate. Um, so, I mean, I, I could keep going, but you guys read the bits of it. Um, the, the main point um, that I kind of get to at the end is that the sheer number and diversity of such texts enunciate the many possible ways these collectives could be imagined and themselves brought into being. Um, and this leaves us with a picture of a Persian who could be affiliated with a multiplicity of places and have diverse origins that little resembled those demanded by nationalism.
Um, and I'm going to give you just a little view of the second book. Um, and so the first book looks at Persian eight selves, um, whereas the second book, um, which I'm still figuring out a title for, um, but I sort of have this for now. Um, uh, Sensibilities of Belonging focuses on Adab as the cultural infrastructure of the Persianate world itself. And studies of Adab overwhelmingly focus on its aesthetic articulations in written form, a result of its modern appropriation as the concept of literature or adabiyat. Um, my work focuses on Adab more expansively and historically um, as the ethical forms, and I look at social conduct, uh, for instance, tied to aesthetic forms that lived beyond the written word or page, animating social meanings and practices, and providing a cultural grammar more widely. So the book argues that the circulation of people, text, practices, and ideas provided the ground for a, a historicized cultural hermeneutics across regions linked by Persian. Um, and drawing on trans-regional studies that by and large are usually focused on um, economic or social history, I look at the Persianate as a cultural space of belonging within which social, social negotiations and politics gained meaning. Um, in terms of material circulation, representational imagery and imaginary as well as sensibility. Um, and just to give you a sense, instead of going through these chapters, I'm gonna give you a sense of what I'm working on right now, um, just to finish, which is, um, so I'm working on this uh, article length uh, work, um, which is about the compan about companionship as a political ethic. Um, and um, basically the expectation of social intimacy according to widely intelligible forms was seen as vital to the practice of justice. Various levels of officials held court um, or made themselves available to hear petitions and attend to the administration of justice. They practiced forms of hospitality and sociability with those they ruled as well as with symbiotic cognates such as men of learning. These were old practices in the Persia Islamic world that had long taken root in Hindustan. Um, and specifically, I look at uh, Ghulam Hussein Taba Tabai's chronicle, the Siyar al Mutaakhirin, which is one of the most widely so um, cited sources on um, 18th century history. Um, and uh, I, I take seriously, it's also understood to be one of the earliest um, critiques of colonialism that was articulated in the 1780s. Um, and one of the things that I do is that I consider its lamentations at the decided lack of sociability in the modes of East India Company governance. Um, and I argue that not all conquest and rule was the same. Um, in this, um, in this kind of critique of colonial rule, Taba Taboi observes the lack of justice under British uh, rule to be a result of their lack of participation or even comprehension of the adab of just rule and its forms of companionship in particular that made rulers aware of who their subjects were and their plights. Um, and so this is to give you a sense of some of the things that he says, um, right? He says, um, and he uses mosahibat um, and the concept of sohbat, which is a word that means both um, com companionship and conversation. Um, and this is a, a very important practice and it, it's a very important practice both in the transmission of knowledge, right? Um, so people say I was at the service of so-and-so or I sat in sohbat with so-and-so um, and you can receive you know, mystical knowledge, you can receive traditional knowledge this way. Um, and, and that this is actually a problem of a lack of proper desire, right? There, these people are not inculcated with proper desires um, for, for conversing and meeting with and listening to the stories, hikayat, which is another kind of um, particular word that refers to a, a kind of moral exemplum, a set of moral stories. Um, in which um, one understands uh, and gains particular benefits from. 
Um, so, you know, the, the, the English have this problem and this is why not only are they not just, but there is no possibility for them to be just without this desire and these practices. Um, so that's, that's basically where I am right now. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you about any of it or answer any questions. Okay. Questions? Well, I, I have one thought just to get things started. Um, and this is actually going back to, to Persian itself. Um, you know, and, and you're very um, sort of conscious of the concepts and categories you use. And of course, Adab is, pardon my Urdu pronunciation, um, is a, um, you know, a sort of a, a, a key organizing um, concept. But I'm wondering about the self, um, what you do with or where that's coming from. I mean, basically, I found this to be a very vexed concept um, and people have written about poetic personas and things like this. And one of the most striking things that I've read, you know, we've all read about how the, you know, individual sovereign autonomous self is like an enlightenment category and blah, 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 right? And so how do we write about selves and other, how do we write about individuals and individuality in other times? And um, for me, a very interesting book that I read um, was uh, Jan Goldstein's book. Um, God, I'm blanking on the title now. Um, but she works, it's a, it's a book that came out in the early 2000s that was basically about, um, she's a kind of intellectual historian and she looks, and social historian, and she looks at the concept of selfhood in French history. Mm. And she actually shows that even in the beginning of the 19th century, this is not the dominant way in um, medical and social and political thought that, that individuals are thought of. Um, and so, yes, the post-revolutionary self, that's exactly it. Um, and so this idea of the interior, interiorized autonomous self, it's not really until about the 1840s that this becomes dominant, even in France. And so this idea that this is the enlightenment self, I mean, that's a kind of hyper real um, idea. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the question, the, the question for me became, what, what are we looking at here? And, and the argument I kind of came up with is that um, selves come into relief um, out of collectives, not the other way, like collect, selves aren't these things that already exist um, that, you know, either elect to or are inducted into these various collectives. Right, and, and the, the kind of self-making that started to become clear um, in the context of these, these texts and these commemorative articulations um, were that these were um, selves that came into being through um, and always with other people. Um, and whether this was speaking about one's genealogy and one's origins um, or speaking about one's social circles um, it, there was always, um, there was a kind of becoming with somebody else. Um, so that's, that's the basic kind of way that I came at it because that seemed, that seemed much, that seemed what was happening in the process of these texts. Right. And, and is there an actual category that could be called self? Um, I mean, one of the things, I mean, not like what you have in Ekbal, right? <laughs> about, about which much has been made, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's not, but, but there is a kind of play, right? Like there's the convention in this writing that it's very ugly to say I, right? So you say this, this poor one, this destitute one, this wretched one, whatever that's, and you speak about yourself in the third person, mm -hmm. right? Um, but 
the fact is, is that there is still, there is still um, a voice and assertion of self happening. But the question is what kind, right? Mm -hmm. If it's not an I, mm -hmm. which assumes primacy, um, what is it? Right? It's a poor one, a wretched one, but it's a poor one and a wretched one that's embedded um, within a set and network of relationships. Mm. And that's that's really what became articulated. It, it clearly became articulated over and over and over. And it was, uh, I mean, this is something I've actually argued in the case um, in an article I wrote a few years ago where I tried to see how far I could trace this logic um, because so much of the stuff that I read um, also talks about self-definition, right? Uh, whatever. <laughs> Ever since Hegel, um, the idea is that, um, you know, it's always the self coming into being against the other. Um, and, and what I was seeing was something else, which was the self coming into being through dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the concept of the monazere, um, and the, the importance of things like companionship and, and um, kind of greater collective context. And so it was a kind of more um, coming into being um, as we. Mm -hmm. um, so so um, what about other aspects of it, like the Zahir, the, 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 the external and the Batan, you know, the, the, the kind of maybe um, Sufi self in, in certain respects. Um, and how, is that something you look at at all? Sort of how that, or, or um, uh, in terms of this, this kind of very social self that you're, you're talking about or whether they interact or anything? I mean, the, the Zahir Batan, I, I think is just part of, um, I mean, that certainly becomes a way of describing um, certain aspects of the self, but it's part of a much broader cultural grammar, right? Yeah. Basically of ontology where certain things belong to the realm of the Baten and certain things to the Zahir, but they're linked, yeah. right? And, and I actually have, I have a little bit of a problem with just translating them as interior exterior, um, mm -hmm. because I think that kind of does a little bit too much interpretation um, and that certainly in certain very specific contexts, you can translate it that way, but I actually think it functions much more fruitfully and generally as the hidden and manifest. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and that I think what's interesting about it is that it helps us understand an epistemology that underlies that pairing in a way that's very different from a post Cartesian um, self right, where you have the interior and exterior. I mean, these are part of the discussions I had with the history of emotions people, which is that they are real feelings and they're inside of us, mm. right? And then, um, you know, we can either be sincere or not by expressing them or not. Yeah. But one of the things that I found is that um, the, the relationship between the hidden and manifest is a little bit different. It's much more intermingled. And it's a similar relationship to adab and akhlaq, right? Where akhlaq doesn't exist without its proper manifestation. It's a kind of necessary um, means of realizing it. You can't just be virtuous on the inside <laughs> and have no proper adab of it, <laughs> right? It doesn't actually fully exist yet. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, I oh, let me just say one more thing, and then we can go to Alana. Um, it, it's kind of like uh, you know, sort of thinking psychoanalytically, the idea of the unconscious as somehow deep, so deeply inside that you can't see it. I mean, this is a certain sort of framework that's placed that's you know on on phenomena that are at some level um, manifest in in many ways. Um, and, and I think the, I, it, my own interest is in kind of using some of these other concepts like Zahir and Batten um, to rethink the psychoanalytic perhaps. But anyway, just to draw a link between what you're talking about and what I think about. Uh, Alana. Uh, 
Um, so I was really struck by um, a paper that you wrote a few years ago. It's, it's on similar topics. It's um, space, sociality, and sources of pleasure. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I read it for my dissertation, and I was really interested in what you wrote about James Frazier and Adab, where you basically said something like, you know, Frazier's teachers accepted him as a novice Persian, one whose deficiencies they could correct by training and teaching him proper Adab, in the context of a well-recognized form of relationship between students and patrons, this kind of mixing, meaning like a non-Persian learning to be Persian, right, was acceptable to his teachers. But what, what you're saying is that Europeans did not understand it the same way. And I mean, I wonder if it would be too bold to draw like a larger conclusion, like that sort of what th this project of yours is saying is like like the the Persianate way of like creating a self, maybe that's a bad term, through proper inculcation of adab, shown through proper akhlaq, anyone can be that. Anyone in some way can be Persianate. Um, but the Western way, at least in this article, as you're presenting Fraser and his European colonial contemporaries, not anyone can learn to be European. Not anyone can be accepted by those categories. That somehow Europeanness is much more bounded than Persian. I mean, that, that's something that's definitely coming into being in the 18th century. Um, and in the late 18th century, the, the second half of it in India, that's, those boundaries are really hardening up. Um, and I, I look at it in another context also with respect to an Armenian who's you know, this kind of liminal category where he's like Christian, but he's not the right kind of Christian. And um, he does learn English and he goes actually to England and gets military training and language training. And he writes his memoir in English, um, but he becomes kind of a victim of hardening colonial boundaries whereby the 1780s, he's not allowed to be an officer because he's of non-European descent, right? Um, so, there comes to be like those boundaries are hardening. And one of the things that I look at, and I don't look, I don't um, talk about it in that particular article, um, but in, in the second book, one of the things I'm looking at is um, the instances where you have these Persians in the, um, and, and they're from Iran and from Hindustan, right? Encountering colonial officials that are, that know Persian or are learning Persian and, um, talk about them as their friends and having so fat with them and all of these kinds of practices. And then looking at the ways in which these um, British officials also call them, like how they call them and how they understand their, like there's a particular idea of what the reciprocal benefits and privileges of those kinds of relationships are amongst Persians that don't get shared by the British that they're in interacting with. Now, the British have their own idea of friendship, right? So they're using particular words to describe the, the people they're interacting with, but that what that relationship entails is undergoing um, a set of understandings with respect to um, public and private space, politics versus um, personal relationships, right? And this is right around the time when the British come in and they're like, oh, Oriental despotism, nepotism, corruption, <laughs> you know? And, and so th there is a kind of incommensurability there. Um, and I wanted to, I think that's an important thing to kind of think about because it's not that there aren't failures um, in relationships in, um, amongst Persians but they're understood to be failures that have to be explained away. Whereas for the, the British, they don't have to be explained away, <laughs> right? There's not even a problem. <laughs> um, so, I mean, th that's something I'm very interested in looking at, right? Like that, that where that incommensurability comes in and where it gets met, where they're no longer speaking the same language or interacting on the basis of a common understanding. I mean, it seemed your project seems really current to like the this moment, right? In like like postmodern history or whatever we want to call it, because like in some ways it it feels like what we're looking at right now 
is either we're gonna share an ethic as Americans or we're gonna share an ethnic as white Americans. Do you know what I mean? This kind of distinction. And to me, that, that sounds a little bit like what your project is asking, like, is the Persian itself a shared ethic or ethnic, something like that? I mean, the I definitely am trying to, I, I started out by really pushing against nationalism, um, which takes uh, place and origin in a very particular way that has really kind of left us up shit creek on numerous fronts, yes. Yes. you know? Um, and the only alternative we seem to have is a particular um, deeply impoverished and limited problematic notion of tolerance, right? Which Wendy Brown has also talked about as regulating aversion. Um, and, and so the, the question becomes, you know, what were some other ways, um, what were some other forms of universalisms that processed difference, that managed difference, right? And, and what can we learn from them? Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's like we've painted ourselves into a corner with our like starting assumptions about the other. And you're asking, how do we paint ourselves out by looking at other possible starting assumptions? Thank you. I had a question, Fran. if it's okay. <laughs> well, uh, let's ask, let's let Fran. Um, let's go Fran, yeah. Then... <laughs> Thank you, Mana. This is just fascinating. And of course, all this other material, I'm, I'm reading your book with, with great pleasure right now. And all this other material is, of course, pretty familiar from the Tazkiras and the poetry and such in Urdu. And it leads me to think, speaking, because you were talking just a minute ago about the relationship with the other, um, almost all the evidence you have and we have is sort of from upper class men and, and their, their visions of adab and their relationships of adab. And of course, it's easy to see why this kind of evidence is available and why they are undoubtedly interested in working out the details and parameters and strictures of adab for themselves because they are the lords of creation. But um, what, what would you have to say or, or what evidence can we find, first of all, about women of various social classes and their forms of adab, and also about poorer people? I mean, did servants, was there an adab for servants and was it connected with the adab for masters? Or um, was, did anybody bother to theorize whether servants had an adab or not? Um, I would just I hope that you would look into these aspects of the question and, and see what, what can be brought to light. Um, thank you. Um, I, I definitely think, I mean, there's obviously limits to what goes on in the book. I did try and talk about other kinds of people. Um, now, I didn't really get too far past the, uh, the elite, um, even though elite is kind of a relational term. Um, but I do talk about women, I talk about non-Muslims, right? And I bring in, especially in the context of women, some example of how um, a certain kind of uh, assignment that's made from the center, right? Where the ideal Persian is male, Muslim, um, and of Middle East origin. <laughs> um, how people who don't fit this bill make certain kinds of claims. Um, and often there are claims that are made against their relegated place in certain hierarchies of proximity um, to the ideal, right? Um, and that they use the same language, the same kind of idealized language to claim a different kind of place for themselves, right? Um, now, obviously, um, this is of greater or lesser um, success in different moments right, in different contexts. Um, but I also have been thinking about this a lot in the context of the second book as well. Um, and I mean, I think things like social location are very, very important, um, but we also, I feel like looking at it, a lot of scholarship is still taking certain modern concepts. And I actually got a lot of, uh, I got a lot of inspiration from um, scholarship from other medieval contexts that basically explains that we need to be really careful about making assumptions about how culture works and how it circulates. Um, 
and there's a there's a, a scholar of, of medieval Christianity, Amy Hollywood, uh, who made a, a great um, uh, intervention into the concept of uh, what was normal or the norm in a certain period of time. And, and we can't think of it like the modern, like the average Joe or the average person, right? Because the norm in that kind of medieval Christian context was God or the saints, right? And that's not like Joe Schmo next door or, <laughs> and so the question is the, how do ideals circulate and what relationship are they supposed to have to everyday people? Um, and I don't know if we have a great understanding of that. I was struck by certain examples that I found of um, supposedly of, of merchant practices, for instance, of sealing a deal by using the modified and simplified version of a, um, of a darba cer uh, ceremonial, right? Where the, there would be a certain kind of exchange of clothing items, like kind of like a khalat. Um, and so, I mean, for me, the fact that we have these elite practices doesn't mean that they're completely cut off and unknown fr from other kinds of people that are circulating in different arenas. Um, so in the second book, I try very much to think about the limits of the Persianate and how far it can go and, and what happens to it in certain contexts when it does go. But this is obviously a lot harder to get into. Um, and I basically bracketed anything that was going to take way too much time for after a tenure track. <laughs> as a practicality, right? When you're on a when you're on a clock trying to get to the end of a degree or a different kind of clock, you also have to be practical about what you can manage to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have um I think we have Quinn and then David. Hi, this is uh great. Thank you so much for this. I'm learning a lot. Um my question is pretty simple. I was just going to ask if you could say a little more about the inculcation of proper desires. And what are the kinds of things that might impede that inculcation? Uh, I'm working on an ethnograph project in Lucknow and I'm focusing on money um, as something that as a force that acts on people and corrupts desires and that, that kind of thing. So I perked up. Um, uh, especially I mean, all the a, other. That's a great question. Um, I mean, the context you're looking at, um, so mine is quite different, but that was why I that was what motivated the question. Right, but this idea of um, power and wealth, you know, worldly power and worldly wealth um, exerting a corrupting force is a very old <laughs> idea, and it's it's definitely um, uh, sort of treated and discussed from lots of different angles in some of the kind of very basic texts of education starting from day one. Um, it, it, obviously your context is different because this would have been in a pre-capitalist context, <laughs> even though there's still such things as worldly wealth and power. And I guess, I guess the challenge- It looks very becomes, different in neoliberal kind of context. Right, right. And so the question becomes, you know, I think first of all, historicizing, because um, the text that I'm thinking of is Saadiz Golestan which actually in multiple places talks about the relationship between power and wealth and even the proper way in which one must have wealth. You have to spend it in particular ways, right? Mm -hmm. Or else you're kind of holding it in a bad way. Um, yeah. And so th the question becomes, so this is a text that's written in um, the 13th century. So when people are reading it in the 17th or 18th century, right? Um, a lot has changed. Right. Hmm. First of all, first and foremost, you have the basic monetization of North India. Right. Like that's something like people are actually handling money. There is a certain kind of um, prestige as well as fraughtness um, with which power and position are shifting. And there is an urgency to certain kinds of morals around its seizure and practice. Um, particularly in 18th century Northern India, for instance, right? So then the question becomes, how does a text that is talking about these issues get read in that context? 
right? Um, and I mean, some of the ways that I was able to think about this is um, to think about um, contemporaneous commentaries on the text or else the way in which um, those aspects of the text were invoked and cited um, and, and used in discussions in a particular setting, right? As well as how those discussions link to um, broader ideas of what was at stake. Um, so it's, it's a way of thinking about um, the way timelessness is reiterated in time, <laughs> right? Like a, a timeless idea is reiterated in time. And there's, there's kind of difference right, then maybe would have been the case in whatever she does in the 13th century where the text was written versus 18th century North India. But there's also a linkage. That's really robust, thank you. David? Uh, yeah, I had a question, I guess, piggybacking on um, part of what Alana was saying. Uh, I'm wondering about this hardening you talked about. Uh, where you said the sort of possibilities of uh, the possibilities of selfhood sort of change and you have these harder borders. I'm wondering uh, to what extent it would be right to just, um, forgive me if this has been now or uh, stupid, um, it would be uh, accurate to call that hardening race, right? And how does that enter into what we're talking about here? Mm, well, yeah, I mean, definitely certain things are, uh, I mean, the hardening is the hardening amongst Europeans, right, and particular British ideas about who could be part of their project and how. Um, but there's a great book um, that, I mean, the thing is, is um, race itself kind of needs to be historicized and it's not necessarily indivisible from something we call religion now um, or from location, place. Um, there's a great book I think that I got a lot out of that helped me think about it. Um, and it was, it's by, God, I'm blanking on her name, Roxanne something. It's called The Complexion of Race. And it specifically looks at um, late 18th um, century ideas, British ideas of um, race, the way it's used. And it, it finds that it's not, it's not modern race yet, right? It is also combined with things that we understand as culture, such as clothing habits and other kinds of practices. Um, but there is a certain, and so there is a way in which you could change the color of your complexion through the adoption of these kind of habits, but when the British in the end of the um, 18th century are in India, that experience begins to really create um, the ground for what comes to harden into something that's more recognizable to us as modern race. Yeah, so to, I guess to be clear, um, I, I'm asking sort of, um, I, I'm asking you to help me uh, think through this, because this is something that I am thinking a lot about, right, is um, the way in which uh, exactly, as you said, right, race emerges in this particular moment. It's not just sort of a fact, of course, waiting to be discovered. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that this emergence also then uh, produces different ways of thinking about the self and the possibilities of being a self, right? Um, and it sort of sounded to me like part of what you're uh, getting at here um, is a kind of um, more, I'm not sure what the right word here is, uh, let's say like dispositional notion of selfhood or something sort of uh, disappears once this kind of hardening, once this kind of whatever we want to call it, pre-race race or whatever starts to appear, right? Um, because, I mean, yeah, sorry. I have to say, I can't really comment on the history of British evolutions of this idea. Um, I do think that um, some of the stuff, uh, Anna Bryson's written about this and some of the stuff she writes about is the way in which um, 
manners become devalued in the British context, right? And that comes along with um, the, the critique of decadent court culture. Um, and it's also about a, a new obsession to do both with political events, but also with certain intellectual developments, um, a, a certain kind of obsession with the concept of sincerity, um, which is predicated on the mind-body split um, that takes hold, right? Through Descartes and others, um, a way of thinking about a difference between some kind of genuine interior um, place and how you act. Um, and, and this kind of growing emphasis uh, over the 17th century with sincerity um, ends up, I mean, it, it, there's a lot there. I, I'm not any kind of expert. Like I've read some stuff on it that helped inform my own thinking, but that's a kind of que question of Britishness. Um, I, I do think that you already have, by the time the British show up, um, in India, you have a different idea of what it means to um, have forms of companionship with one another. There is a set of formally recognized modes of relating um, to different people based on social location, um, occupation, et cetera, that is part of Persianate Adab um, that includes understanding particular relationships according to privileges and obligations that the British don't share and a number of things prevent them from even wanting um, to really kind of understand, let alone embody. Um, and this becomes hardened into a set of uh, practices and interdictions um, that come into being through early colonial rule. I mean, that's kind of the best I can give you. <laughs> Can I follow up on that and ask what are some of the assumptions that the British are making that stop them from like even wanting to be a kind of Persianate self? I mean, part of it, part of it is, um, I mean, I'll give you an, a very easy example. Um, part of it is just, I mean, we've, we've read from Muhammad Tavakoli, for instance, right? He's read, written about um, Orientalism's Genesis Amnesia and about how all of these experts um, in the 18th century who were trained in whether it was Sanskrit or Persian or whatever, um, they basically erased their teachers and their collaborators. Um, and that's just, you know, th th there's this kind of idea and separation between the professional and the personal, the political and the personal where, oh, this person was really nice and he taught me these things, but I don't owe him anything, right? And, and that, that wouldn't have worked or, or we're friends and this person you know, has, is in my employ, but when he needs help with something like this, I don't need, I, 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 oh, sorry, I can't, my hands are tied. You know, th there is a kind of separation that happens between different kinds of spheres for the British that are not part of Persian understandings of those relationships. And so that's where the, dis the disconnect happens. So there's actually a book by um, Scanlon called What We Owe Each Other. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It, it, no. it out, um, hold on, What We Owe, let me just, uh, yeah, T.M. Scanlon, What We Owe Each Other. I think it was written in like the 90s and it's, the, the core point of that book is reassessing precisely that lack of owing that has like um, in, in his way, like disfigured Western relationships. Um, and you might find it really interesting. And um, I, I suggested to you in a private message, but maybe everyone here might be interested. There's a TV show called The Good Place that bases their entire, the entire premise of four seasons of the show is asking what we owe each other in the West and reassessing Western moral relations based on reconceptualizing that question. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah it might be useful. And I mean, one of the things, one of the things that I'm, I taught a seminar um, a couple of times. Khadija took it with me last time I taught it. It's called Significant Others, and this is something I look at, which is the evolution of the concept of civil society and the public sphere. And what happens as a result of the evolution of these concepts to the notion of friendship? 
right? Um, and we have really good histories of friendship from the me medieval and early modern period. And then kind of what happens from the 17th century on to this idea in the Western context um, versus how it kind of lives and circulates through, and I try and look broadly, we looked at China <laughs> um, as well as kind of Middle Eastern and South Asian context to kind of think about how um, the notion of friendship, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't undergo all of these separations like it does in the European context, yet we're speaking in English with all of these notions that are embedded in the word friendship, which is kind of automatically connotes as like a private relationship where you don't actually owe each other things. <laughs> right? um, and that certain kinds of separations are built into it. Which is odd because if we go back to like Aristotle and what we say is like the Western roots of friendship, Aristotelian friendship is all about ethic, like, what is it? Interconstituted ethics of owing. You know, we owe our friends certain ethical duties in, in the Nicomachean ethics, you know? Right. But that gets reread in different ways. And he also has a, um, a hierarchical valuation given to the utility free friendship. Right. right. It's oh. friends for their own sakes. And when you read when you read the, the um, Islamic and especially the Persian articulations of this, um, that gets refigured. Um, and that's important. Right. Gorica. Hi, uh, thank you for that. I just have a quick question about um, sort of going back to the beginning where you were talking about linkages um, and particularly when you use the term methodological nationalism. Uh, so in the context of area studies and then also sort of like, you know, fields like anthropology or religion also get divided into subfields that are basically implants of area studies, right? Um, and I, and I wanted to sort of get, I, I was wondering like what you concept, how you conceptualize of like various turns in this field away from these um, sort of away from regionalization. For instance, I'm thinking of like how, you know, it, if there was like a sort of historiography of the turn away from regionalization, one note could be like Sheldon Pollock and this turn to like cosmopolitanism and these um, sort of pre-nationalist cosmopolitan spheres. Um, and uh, so, so in that, like language emerges as this object that is used to displace the nation state as the, as the sort of defining object when talking about a certain space. So we're defining the space now linguistically or through like linguistic boundaries or the porosity of linguistic boundaries uh, in spaces as opposed to nation state. Um, geographical boundaries. Um, and then there was a sort of turn to like translation with, you know, I'm thinking more of like Barry Flood and talking about objects moving and like translation is not just being about text and language. But um, I mean, I wonder what do you think of how language emerges as an object in this sort of, um, you know, in, in these studies that sort of uh, offer a corrective to the contemporary geostatist, nationalist presumptions that scholars have in studying, you know, like the object of their inquiry. Because um, I mean, I, I think then like we also, like there is a sort of like the idea of language as correcting the idea of a nation, right? Even if it's not like overtly meant as a corrective, it does emerge as one, right? For instance, like scholars will write, scholars who work in that field will write in a sort of postscript or something to their work, um, something about, contemporary nationalism, right? Like connecting this idea of the pre-nation state, whatever geographic entity with its linguistic porosity to contemporary nationalism and being like, well, this universalism is different from this one. But do you think that like language or has emerged in that discourse as a sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's either a catch-all or a sort of, um, like what does language as an object of inquiry mean when it is being used to do this, uh, heavy theoretical work of displacing nation and nation state as the center of our inquiry? Um, thanks for your question. So I'm gonna first say that I have a hard stop at noon. 
Um, so I have to kind of pivot to another meeting <laughs> right at that time. Um, but your question is a good one. I would maybe reframe it a little bit. Um, so let's say that the way in which language has been taken up, uh, particularly in pre-modern context, but not just, um, to show the inadequacies of the nation state frame, I think is a kind of better way of posing it. Um, but I, I'm not sure if it's it's necessarily just language as such. There's also a way, right? P Pollock's idea is the cosmopolis, not just the Sanskrit language, right? So there's particular um, ways of approaching and formulating and framing um, to do with language that definitely does do that. Um, I think the other thing is, um, the other challenge to that has been um, in the context of interventions from religious studies, for instance, right? And I obviously know Islam best, um, but someone like Shahab Ahmad um, challenging what has been essentially, and he's not the only one, people like Shahzad Bashir have done this too, um, looking at, you know, uh, challenging the idea that Islam is like the Arab Middle East. And, and, and maybe if we're, you know, being inclusive, we can add some Iranians and some, um, you know, we can add Anatolia too. Um, but the, the, this idea that, that that's, you know, very, very limiting um, and that makes Arabic the prime language of, of Islam, right? And it's a Middle East thing. And Shahab Ahmed's work along with a number of others like kind of explodes that out. And it's not just, you know, then it becomes like the derivative or later story of Islam, right? There's this idea. And he interestingly takes the very opposite stance which is that language isn't important, <laughs> right? There's a, there's a lexicon, there's a conceptual lexicon, but it doesn't matter what language it's articulated in, right? So that's a, that's a kind of um, other way of coming at the problem. Um, so so there, is, there is language and then there's not language. I mean, my own idea about it um, is, is really that we might, there may be shared concepts across language and adab is a very good example of that right it it exists it, it exists in in multiple um you know arabic turkish urdu uh various different traditions but um the way in which um justice or generosity or um happiness uh, may be articulated in a particular tradition is specific to that language tradition. Um, and I, I always give this example that when we're talking about just rule, you know, stories about pre-Islamic Persian kings is not how they're articulating it in Morocco. Um, they, they have their own sets of stories and figures and an accrued tradition, right? And so while it's not fully separate and there may be a lot of resonance and overlap, um, it's not uh, it's not the same thing necessarily. Um, so on, in some sense, language matters, but it's also not a mutually exclusive hermetic uh, distinction. That's that's how I would answer it. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess we're out of time. So I just want to have time to thank you very much for um, this really excellent uh, introduction to your work. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions and um, take care. Have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah.